Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. Amy, are you ready to talk back tonight? Oh, I think so. Good. All right. Well, because tonight we've got another episode of Talk Back for our listeners. In our Talk Back episodes, we listen to a sermon or a podcast or other audio from a well-known pastor or teacher, and then we break in with our commentary as we compare his or her teaching with the Word of God. And if you're a new listener here at A Word Fitly Spoken, we also want to let you know that our goal of our Talk Back episodes is to help you learn to listen to teaching discerningly. That's right. We want to be able to think critically and biblically about teachers and materials which claim to be Christian. Now, I want to assure you, and I promise we are not attacking or slandering or nitpicking. We love you, our listeners, and we want to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus without being deceived. And Michelle and I prayed a few moments ago uh, that the Lord would watch over our hearts and our mouths as this is going to be a very difficult topic. That's right. And tonight, it's kind of a somber topic, too. We have the the sad duty of bringing you some recent teaching from Alistair Begg. Um, Alistair Begg has been the pastor of Parkside Church in Cleveland, Ohio, since 1983, more than 40 years. That's a really long time of, of faithful service. And he also heads up his own parachurch teaching ministry, Truth for Life. And he has he has long had a reputation for being a good, doctrinally sound pastor and speaker and teacher. Well, until recently, his his Truth for Life broadcast could be heard on over 1,800 Christian radio stations via AFR, which is American Family Radio. And for many years, uh, like I said, Alistair Begg has been regarded by millions as a doctrinally sound, trustworthy pastor and teacher. That's right. And because he has such a stellar reputation for biblical fidelity, it was really shocking uh, recently to hear what he had to say in his Truth to Life video interview, which was actually posted several months ago in September of 2023, uh, but for some reason recently went viral on social media in January of 2024. And it's about some advice that he gave to a grandmother who asked him if she should attend her grandson's upcoming wedding. And either the grandson or the individual uh, who uh, the grandson was uh, supposed to marry is a uh, trans or someone who lives as the opposite gender. Now, we need to note that Alistair Begg's stance on homosexual lifestyles and weddings, that has not changed. And he has not gone soft on these folks living in sin and turning their backs on God. He's always preached the truth about that. and uh, it, But it's the counsel to the grandmother that we're going to focus on tonight. So let's listen in to that soundbite from back in September of 2023. You and I know that we field questions all the time that go along the lines of, uh, my grandson is about to be married to a transgender person, and I don't know what to do about this, and I'm calling to ask you to tell me what to do, mm. which is a huge responsibility. And in a conversation like that just a few days ago, um, and uh, people may not like this answer, but I asked the I asked the grandmother, "Does your grandson understand your uh, belief in Jesus?" Yes. Does your grandson understand that your belief in Jesus makes it such that you can't countenance uh, in any affirming way the choices that he has made in life? Yes. I said, "Well, then, okay. As long as he knows that." then I suggest that you do go to the ceremony, mm. and I suggest that you buy them a gift. Mm. Oh, she said, H -h 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 what? She was caught off guard. I said, well, here's the thing. You're, you're not going to, your, your love for them may catch them off guard, but your absence will simply reinforce the fact that they said these people are what I always thought, judgmental, critical, unprepared mm -hmm. to countenance anything. And it is a fancy, it is a fine line, isn't it? It really yeah. is. And people need to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. But I think we're going to take that risk. We're going to have to take that risk a lot more if we want to build bridges into the hearts and lives of those who don't understand Jesus and and don't understand that he is a king. 
Now, that was the soundbite. And before we get into the advice that he gave, I want to pause for a second and talk about that, just that last sentence first, because it's really the overarching theme, the why. And uh, ladies, that's a great place to help sharpen our discernment skills. Start with the why rather than the what. And the why in this case is building bridges. But how? How, how is that supposed to happen? Well, according to Alistair Begg, it's by showing the world that we are are just like them. We're not weird or critical. We are loving and we want all the same things, right? Now, this kind of approach is called contextualization or contextualizing the culture. And you see this on the mission field where Christians try to help unbelievers understand God by using something from their own culture, whether uh, the people are Muslims or members of a tribe in Africa, something like that. And there are different levels of contextualization contextualization models in the mission field, I believe uh, five or six of them, where level one is uh, really a great way to do it. it. It's the way we're all supposed to do it. And we see this example, uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, telling an audience in Athens that he noticed one of their altars had this inscription that said, to the unknown God. And so basically, he tells them, hey, let me proclaim to you who the real God is, And then he shares the gospel with them. And notice in Acts 17 that he doesn't bow down to that altar along with the crowd in order to be like them or to be accepted. But then the other end of the contextualization spectrum is problematic when the message becomes paganized and, you know, truth then becomes compromised. The result is a false doctrine. And you see that in churches that try to incorporate things like modern psychology or uh, new age practices or cultural trends like critical race theory into their theology. And this usually happens because we want to be attractional. You see that in seeker-friendly churches. We want to be attractional and attract the unsaved world. We want them to admire us as Christians and to think that we are loving rather than being all judgy. And, you know, that sounds like that is what might be happening here in this context. Michelle, what do you think? Amy, you're so right. You know, it is so important that we make sure that we do not try to bend the Bible to the world. Um, You know, we've got to teach the truth of Scripture, and this is especially important for pastors. And and he is guilty here a little bit of uh, of contextualizing and and sort of bending the Bible to the sensibilities of the world and the way the way he's contextualizing is that, you know, as Christians, we don't base our decisions about things of this nature, especially, you know, with our witness at stake and and people's uh, salvation potentially at stake. We don't base our decisions about things like this on how other people might react or what they might think. That's actually a sin called the fear of man. It's when we put people's opinions of us instead of God's opinion of us. Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. So when it comes to dilemmas like the grandmothers, we trust in the Lord and we obey scripture and we base our decisions on what scripture says and let the chips fall where they may. We do not base our decision on how someone else might react. And that is the only way, as that verse says, to be safe. Whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Scripture is our authority, not man. Yeah. So why don't we address some of the points that we just heard, you know, starting with uh, the grandmother's question. Uh, She asks him, you know, my grandson is about to be married to a a transgender person. So it's the other person who is transgendered. And, uh, you know, a lot of people writing articles, doing podcasts on social media, all of that, keep referring to this situation as a gay wedding or a marriage between uh, two homosexuals. But we want to be clear here. Um, You know, I mean, that's a similar situation and we can talk about similar situations, but that's not what this is. This is different. It, it's a trans. So when we write or comment or podcast on things, we need to be really accurate about what this is. Right. We we really do. And that's that's something that has been just kind of annoying me a little bit. Maybe I'm too annoyable. But we need to get our facts straight uh, when we're talking about things like this, first of all, because our credibility is at stake. You know, if you're if you're talking about something like this and you don't even have the very basic facts straight, 
nobody's going to listen to you or think or people that you might uh, otherwise sway to your opinion are going to think, well, this person doesn't even know what she's talking about. So we need to get those things straight. But then also it's important because you know, technically this could be on a biological level, a one man marrying one woman kind of thing. So it's not necessarily the homosexual issue. If, if, you know, this, the grandson is male and the transgender person is a female who is pretending to be a male. Um, But, you know, that's, and I actually had a follower ask me about that. You know, she said, what if, what if the, uh, the grandson was marrying a woman who is transitioning into being a man? Not that there is such a thing, but um, she said, would, would that be okay? And, uh, and so we need to make sure that that's another reason that we need to make sure we have our facts straight is because there are other questions that may arise that, that we would need to answer. So that was, yeah, that was just something that bugged me a little bit is that this is getting tossed about a lot and, uh, and people are not being precise. So we need to be precise when we're talking about these things. She said my, or at least what he quoted her as saying is that her grandson was about to be married to a transgender person. So that's what we're talking about here. Not a homosexual wedding, although some of the same principles do apply. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, correct. And it is, It I, I know I'm confused. It, it gets very confusing. Um, but speaking of confusing, you know, the question comes up, how is it not confusing for your grandchild to, uh, quote, know where you stand on this issue? And then you show up to the wedding anyway, and you show up with a gift. You know, Michelle, weddings are a celebration of holy matrimony. I mean, you're there to celebrate. So uh, I, I just don't understand how going, but then hoping that your your grandchild knows where you stand is going to matter at all. Yeah, I agree. And really, if you think about it, pretty much everybody, uh, pagan or Christian, who knows anything about weddings. And Alistair Begg, you know, a pastor who performs weddings, he's probably performed a lot of them over his career. He should certainly know this about weddings. Uh, Anybody can tell you that by being a non-objecting witness at a wedding, you are making the statement that you support and approve of that union. That's what your presence says. That's what, you know, not objecting when the, if they even include the part of the wedding anymore that says, if anyone here can show just cause why these two people cannot be married to one another, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. Well, if you don't say anything, you are, for all intents and purposes, you are supporting that that union. Yeah. So why would any pastor suborn the sin of hypocrisy by encouraging a Christian to express disapproval of that union and then turn right around and demonstrate support for the union by joyfully attending the quote unquote wedding with a gift? And then in the future, and if, if the object of doing this is to leave the door open for her to share the gospel with him in the future, how is she, when sharing the gospel with her grandson, how is she going to call him to repent of this sin that she has already approved of by attending his wedding? Yeah. So that that would just be more hypocrisy in the future. Well, it, it does rather uh, ruin her witness to him in the future, you know, um, because if she begins to share the gospel and and share the truth with this uh, this young man that, uh, you know, how is he going to even believe her? You know, you, but Grandma, right. you came, you know, what, what does this mean? So, yeah, it, it is very confusing. Yeah. And, you know, we've heard testimonies from people who have come out of horrible, egregious sin like this that they've been they've been held captive to by Satan. We've heard people like this say when they come out of it and get saved, or if they come out of it and get saved, they'll say, you know, it wasn't the people who coddled me in my sin that drew me out of of this sin. It was people who lovingly but kindly stood their ground and would not, you know, were honest with me and told me that I was in sin and shared the truth of the gospel with me, even though it was hard, even though I got mad at them and yelled at them or cut them out of my life or whatever. Those are the people that help me, you know, the Lord used to bring me out of this. So we need to remember that as well. That's that's sort of a practical thing. But 
that, um, you know, that's important as well. It is. And I have a friend who, uh, when she was 17, engaged in a um, sexual relationship with another woman and lived as a lesbian for most of her adult life. I, I can't remember if she was in her 30s or 40s, but um, it wasn't until uh, she had moved into a new house and uh, was going through something and her new next door neighbor came over to introduce herself and understood the situation rather quickly, uh, you know, the homosexual relationship and said, um, you you know, I, I have to share something with you. And, and she shared the gospel with her. And then she left a tract. And she said, you know, it's, it, yes, it is wrong, uh, what you're doing. Uh, but not because I so, say so, but because the Lord says so. And, and here's where he says it. And so uh, she shared the full gospel and, and the entire truth. And she said that more than anything uh, that her family ever said to her uh, really was the catalyst for for change. And, and of course, today, she lives as a, a redeemed uh, woman who loves the Lord. And, and who is no longer a lesbian. That that part of her identity is gone. So um, praise God that that does happen. Amen. Praise God. And look, God knows what he's doing, right? I mean, yeah. anytime we think we know better than God or we can handle things uh, in a different way than God has told us to in Scripture, we're wrong. We're wrong to think that we yeah. know better than God. And we're in sin to think that we know better than God. That's, that's prideful and that's lack of... Uh, submitting to God's authority in our lives as the God of the universe. So yeah, we, God knows what he's doing. We just need to obey him. <laughs> yeah. And, we're very wise words in Proverbs three, uh, lean not on your own understanding, right? So exactly. we need to uh, yeah, always, always keep that in mind. Exactly. God's ways are higher than our ways, you know, and his thoughts yes. are higher than our thoughts. That's also in Isaiah somewhere, but, um, yeah, it's it's really important to mm. submit to what God says, not our own opinions. <laughs> and then, you know, we also want to think about uh, even if she has told the grandson that she disapproves of what he's doing and, and that it's a sin. And maybe she has really sat down with him and shared the gospel with him. And and he is thoroughly familiar with her her opinion on all of the, or her stance on all of this. Um what about his the person he's going to quote unquote marry? Does that person know? I mean, has has she had the opportunity to to explain this to him or her or whoever it is? Uh, what about the rest of the wedding party? What about the person who's performing the wedding? What about all the other guests? Do they all know that she disapproves? Well, no, because they are seeing her show up at the wedding with a gift, right? What about all her friends who know that she's going to attend the wedding? Do all of them know? You know, this is too many people to chase around and, and say, look, I'm going to this wedding, but really I disapprove. You know, your right. attendance at a wedding <laughs> means that you approve of the marriage. That is what your attendance says. And so and as well, these are all also reasons that Christians don't attend homosexual weddings. So it's really important that we we take all of these things into consideration. I mean, your your actions are witnessed by a lot of people. I mean, even even in situations not this intense, people are always watching us and we need to be sure we walk circumspectly in this world and and we do not um, lead people to believe by our example that something that is sinful is okay. Yeah. Amen. You know, uh, Michelle, a few admirers of uh, Alistair Begg have expressed their complete confusion about his advice that we just heard. And, uh, you know, compared to the sermons that he's always given, in which his teaching uh, is right on about homosexuality, clearly aligned with scripture uh, in his teachings. And he says, I, you hear these comments saying, oh, I don't know why he gave her that advice, because he doesn't believe that. He doesn't affirm uh, homosexuality, you know, those kinds of things. So, and that's a Exactly what he did do, though. That's why this is so confusing. Right. Um, and again, we're we're talking about the advice. We're not talking about you know anything else about what he has taught in the past, which has always been pretty solid. Uh, in that advice to the grandmother, he affirmed perversion, and he uh, actually asked her to do the same. Right. I don't know what else you would would call this, especially since uh, he, as we're going to see as as this story unfolds, he's refusing correction. So you know, Jesus said, our words and our actions reveal what is in our hearts. Uh, he said, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. 
and the evil person out of his evil produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. That's in Luke 6.45. Right. Um, and then also, you know, the Bible says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. That's in uh, James 2.18. And uh, another verse is, uh, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's Matthew 15.8. So, uh, so there's a lot of Bible verses. Uh, and so our stance right now is we're uh, we're going to wait and see, pray for repentance, absolutely. But, you know, this is what is uh, in the heart, what he believes right now. So uh, that that's what's happening in this snapshot in time. Yeah, that's right. And it's, you know, people always say, oh, you don't know what's in that person's heart. Yes, you do know what's in that person's heart. The Bible tells us in those verses that you just read, especially that Luke 6, 45 verse that says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And um, so we, yeah, we can tell what's in people's hearts from the way that they act and the things that they say. And uh, at least about this very particular specific situation, this is what he believes or he wouldn't have given this advice to this this woman in the first place and uh, and he wouldn't have uh, continued to stick by that advice so um and I kind of thought it was interesting that in in the video as he's telling this story he says he gave this advice to the grandmother and and she was caught off guard by this and I thought well, of course she was caught off guard. You're Alistair Begg. Everybody was caught off guard, you know. Um, it was just so completely out of character. And I got to think that should really tell us something about our own beliefs and our own behavior. If a bunch of trustworthy, doctrinally sound people freak out when you say or do something, you would better give it some more thought. You better get back into scripture. You better do a lot of praying and you better make sure that what you're saying or doing is actually biblical. Um, so w- that's something that we can learn from this situation for our for ourselves. You know, I was thinking earlier how God puts stories in the Bible of, of people sinning so that we can learn from things like that. But he also gives us contemporary examples uh, like this one that we can look at and think about and consider our own actions. You know, the Bible says, let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And this is one of those opportunities for us to take heed for our own walks and our own lives. Yeah. Uh, and, and I want to let our listeners know, too, that after that uh, video went viral in uh, January, it was really almost a week before uh, anything from Alistair Begg or his Truth for Life ministry team uh, responded at all. So in that long period of time, you know, a lot of people wanted to know if he would recant or what he had to say about this. And I, I was really glad to see that many Christian leaders and influencers called for patience and grace mm-hmm. and prayer, of course while waiting for this brother to explain. After all, he is a well-known teacher who is much admired. He has taught sound doctrine for years. And so uh, I appreciated the call to wait, be slow to respond. You know, don't write him off right away. Let's just wait and see. Uh, because, you know, that that was, you, you know how mm-hmm. social media is. You say something and it's out there forever. So, um, and of course, several preachers went on record about how they would handle such a question. And one of those teachers uh, I was glad to see was our friend Justin Peters, who put out a video titled, Can a Christian Attend a Homosexual or Trans Wedding? And uh, we have the link to that in our show notes if you're interested. It's very good. Um, But I'd like to play a clip from that presentation, Michelle, and he's really speaking to the witness that we have. And he talks about whether our attendance would be a good witness to others. So here's that clip from Justin Peters. In speaking of the desire to be a witness, um, the desire to share the gospel. What does it say not only to the to the couple, but everyone else, and in, in attendance at this ceremony, and everyone in a wedding ceremony? I mean, you're there for a reason. You're there because you know that couple, right? You're either a family member or you're a friend. That's why you're there. And so, when everyone else at the ceremony sees you and they know you profess to be a Christian. But you're just there kind of mingling and attending and not saying any, not one syllable of protest. 
uh, they're going to assume, well, here's a Christian and he and he or she is there right here at this homosexual transgendered wedding. What kind of testimony is that? It's a horrible, horrible testimony. And what about our witness to God? Dear friends, how can you attend something that is an abomination to God and sit there silently? What does that say to him? You know, the only measure that we have of our love for God is our obedience to God. Our love for God is not measured by feelings and emotions because feelings and emotions come and go. They ebb and wane. If you want to know how much you love God, ask yourself this question. How much do I obey God? Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, obeys them, he is the one who loves me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you want to get an idea of how much you love God, just take some spiritual inventory. Look at your life. How much do I obey him? How much do I obey him? Not when it's easy, but when it's hard. All right. So that was Justin Peters. Again, we have that uh, link in our show notes if you'd like to go watch that video. And I really appreciated what everything that he said uh, in the in the whole video, really, but especially in that clip, too. We have got to watch the way that we walk in the world. We've got to walk worthy, you know, of the of the calling with which we've been called. It's important. What we do is important. We don't, as Christians, we don't just get to to do whatever we want. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we're supposed to act like that. We are his sons and daughters, and we carry his name, yeah. and we are to represent him well in this world. We are to make him proud of us, yes. so to speak. And um, so what he said was just right on the yeah. money. Well, why don't we talk about the cultural fallout for just a moment of all about this? You know, we know that this does great damage to the kingdom, the church, uh, when a well-respected pastor publicly gives unwise counsel, and that's exactly what's happening right now. And that is what is actually causing division, not the people who question or express alarm, but those who are teaching something that goes against God's word. The Apostle Paul says this really clearly in Romans 16. Uh, verses 17 and 18. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So we are seeing that happening right now in the church over this topic, um, but what impact does this have on a watching world, people who aren't Christians? And do these consequences matter? Well, listen to what a homosexual author and a quote-unquote pastor, Matthew Vines, tweeted out. Now, if you're not familiar with Matthew Vines, uh, he is the founder of something called the Reformation Project, and that uh, is a whole mission to seek to make Bible-believing churches bend and open their minds to being uh, gay-affirming by using personal personal stories, experiences, and really emotional manipulation. And by the way, gay affirming is a term that you might have heard before about churches. It's actually being called a reconciling church now. Reconciling church is the new term that's coming on the scene. That sounds loving, doesn't it? Reconciling. But anyway, uh, Vines also is the author of the book God and the Gay Christian uh, that came out a decade ago and is a leading voice in this movement. And here's what he tweeted out. Out, uh, right after uh, this happened. He said, Alistair Begg, a non-affirming pastor, recently encouraged a grandmother to attend her grandson's same-sex wedding as a way to show him Christ's love. I am grateful for that. Despite significant backlash, Begg has chosen to stand by his advice this week. So this is exactly what many sisters and brothers in Christ have been pleading with Alistair Begg to understand, that pagans and God-haters, progressives, others, naturally would be very excited by Pastor Begg's statements. Now, the unheeded warnings of unintended consequences have definitely proven true, haven't they? They really have. I mean, that the whole um, side B and revoice yeah. and, uh, you know, just everybody on the homosexuality is OK side, perversion is OK side. 
are are probably just very excited about this because now we've got this big um you know christian celebrity and he's always been doctrinally sound now he's on our side mm-hmm. so you know we he he's he's championing our movement they could they could think yeah and and that is really that just is heartbreaking to me i'm just sitting here thinking about that and and just thinking how it seems like he's gone over to the other side. We're not saying that he has. Uh, he he says that he still sa- stands by scripture on on these things being sins, and and that's good. And I'm really glad about that. But it just proves even more that this action that he recommended to this woman, how it's seen by so many people, yeah. you know, on, especially on the, on the side of sin. If you've got people like Matthew Vine saying that what you did was great, you really better re-examine yourself. And that's God's grace to, to Alistair Begg. That him, that tweet, I mean, it sounds terrible to us, but that hopefully he has seen, Alistair Begg has seen that and has, you know, realizes that that is a red flag, that that is God's grace to him to wake him up and say, oh, this was wrong, you know? Right. Right. And, and it's not, yeah. And it's not just the, um, it's not just the people on that side of the issue that are, you know, confused and, and maybe excited about, uh, his, his statement, but what about people, you know, Christian people who know the right answer to this, this question and they're in the same situation as this grandmother. Yeah. Um, I heard I heard from one of my followers yesterday on social media, and she here's what she said. She said, I'm a mom with a prodigal who might very well find herself in the situation described. I have preemptively stated in no uncertain t- terms that I will not attend such an event like the trans wedding. And I've said why. She said it has caused a lot of conflict and the the child, the her trans child, is presently living with her. So it's even worse. Yeah. Um, she says, so now I don't even have the backing for <laughs> my alleged unloving meanness and bigotry of supposedly solid folks with public ministries. She says, okay, I'll go it alone. Yeah. But I can't emphasize enough how I am living this very story and Alistair Begg just did the equivalent of abandoning me in the midst of a bloody battle. Mm, So what about those people? You know that, of course, everybody was stunned that he said this, but now people like this poor lady who have looked up to him and know the answer that he should have given, she says she feels abandoned by by that advice. So that just breaks my heart. Understandably, yes. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next part of this story. Shortly after the video of Alistair's remarks began making the rounds, American Family Radio approached the leadership of Truth for Life to clarify uh, Alistair Begg's remarks and then also to plead with him to repent. And sadly, they were unsuccessful. AFR issued this statement on January 24th, 2024. They said, at American Family Association, that's the parent company of American Family Radio, at American Family Association, we believe it to be an act of unfaithfulness to God to attend a ceremony that celebrates any union outside of the biblical model of marriage as being between one man and one woman. Members of our leadership team held a call with Alistair Begg's team and were unsuccessful in convincing them of his error. As a result of this, we will no longer air Pastor Alistair Begg's Truth for Life program. So, wow, that's quite a bombshell. That was a big moment and um, very surprising to hear that he, as somebody who was in that meeting, had said um, that uh, it was very clear that he was doubling down is is the term that they used, doubling down. So um, he, yeah. he didn't want to recant or anything like that. Uh, yeah. Very unfortunate. You know, Amy, I, I can't help but say this again. I'm I'm reading through uh, Exodus in my daily Bible reading time, and I'm mm-hmm. right at the part where uh, Moses keeps going to Pharaoh again and again and saying, let my people go. And God graciously keeps providing Pharaoh chance after chance after chance to truly repent and do the right thing. And I'm not saying Alistair Begg is anything like Pharaoh. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But 
we we're seeing this pattern again and again and again. He's been he's being confronted lovingly about this and again and again akin to Pharaoh, he is saying, no, I am not. I'm going to, you know, keep digging my heels in. I am not going to, to do the right thing. And it's very, it's very upsetting. It's very disturbing to watch someone do this intentionally like this. God in his grace is giving him all of these opportunities to repent. I, I have a follower. I cannot confirm this, but if someone who follows me. I have really no reason to to question her veracity. She said she was a she's a member of Alistair Begg's church. And she was in church the day that he told this story same story in church, which was before the video came out, sometime before that. And he told this story in church and people, I don't know if it was the elders or who, but at least some people confronted him about this and said this is not right. And he dug his heels in at that time as well. So he just keeps doing this and doing this and doing this. And it's it's just heartbreaking to watch any Christian that would do something like that. So um, we sure want to pray for him that that he does not harden his heart and, and keep turning down these these opportunities to repent. Right, right. And, and so, you know, even after American Family Radio took, uh, Alistair Begg's show off the air, there were still calls for, uh, people to just wait. Let's wait to hear from him ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to hear it in his own words. And so after several days of, you know, general backlash and, and calls for him to repent, on Sunday, January 28th, uh, Pastor Begg finally responded publicly to all of this in a sermon at his church that we could all hear. And, uh, so we've put some links to both the entire sermon and uh, then just a shorter compilation of the most relevant portion uh, of that uh, sermon in the show notes for you. But, you know, Michelle, they're just too long to play right here in in this program. But we do want to give you four moments, four key moments in that sermon. And I know, um, I I just want to say off the top, I know this is going to seem like, you know, we're just picking things out of context. And and I guess that would be, you know, anytime you pick sound bites, that that would be true. But that that is why we do encourage you to go and listen to the entire sermon. I think it's about 45 minutes long or so, and uh, you can hear for yourself in context. But um, but here's the sound bites that we wanted to play. And, and let me um, start by just kind of setting up uh, the sermon itself. He begins the sermon, it was on a Sunday night, in Luke chapter 15, um, and, and he opens up uh, with the story of the Pharisees uh, were grumbling because Jesus was mingling with sinners and even eating with them. And so Jesus began to tell the three parables about celebrating the lost sinner who was found focusing on the prodigal son the most, a lost sinner who returns home. And the father calls for a celebration, you know the story, uh, while the older brother sulks and becomes angry. And yes, it is very true that uh, one brother does understand grace, the younger brother, the other older brother does not. And so we, we keep coming back to the hardening of the heart of this older brother and and how much like the Pharisees uh, that this older brother is. In fact, Pastor Begg makes a very interesting comparison of this son to the Pharisees in Jesus's audience who are listening in. So let's take a listen to that right now. But look at the way the fellow operates. And Jesus is telling this story and the awareness of the fact that it is these religious leaders who are opposed to him who will eventually kill him. In verse 29, I never disobeyed you. You never gave me a goat. No, I I didn't get what I deserved. But this, your son, can't even bring him to say my brother. This, your son, actually this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, who said anything about prostitutes? Pharisees often complain loudly of sins. They would be quite interested in committing themselves. Be very, very careful when you hear your pastor or your teacher, whoever it is, lambasting a certain area of life, especially in the realm of morality. Time and time again, you will discover that that loud protestation actually, sadly, tragically, proved to be a very thin smokescreen for what was actually going on 
in the hearts of these people. Wow. Uh, you know, Amy, the, uh, the way that he just handled that passage of scripture so badly, I'm wondering if I should be more concerned about his mishandling of scripture there than the actual advice he gave to that lady. Yeah. He should know that that is not what that, that parable is about. The, yes, absolutely. The older brother was emblematic of the Pharisees, but the problem that Jesus was addressing is that all of these sinners were repenting and the Pharisees were upset and were not rejoicing because some of these were very sinful people, you know, tax collectors, Gentiles, whatever. And they were repenting and coming to Christ and the Pharisees were upset about it. This is this is not about people calling other people to repent from their sin. This right. is about people not being overjoyed that people are coming into the kingdom. And Alistair Begg, someone of his stature that I consider like way high above mine, ought to know that very basic um, explanation of that parable, right? Yeah, and unfortunately, he kept coming back to uh, the Pharisees and about how upset they were uh, that uh, Jesus or uh, the people in the parables were excited and joyful about a repentant sinner. And uh, boy, that that sure made it feel like he was talking about somebody other than the Pharisees. It seemed to be addressing his critics, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and a lot of people that heard that sermon felt the same way. So um, it, it just right, seemed really, right. um, really interesting. Yeah, he was really he, he was really playing the Pharisee card there. And we did an episode called Are You Being Dealt the Pharisee Card or Are You Being Played the Pharisee Card or something like that. And we're yeah. going to link that up in the show notes in case you would like to um to listen to that, listeners. All right. Well, why don't we go to the next clip? This is where he, and, and these are all in order, by the way, of, uh, I didn't take anything and move it around. This next clip is where he addresses his comments at first about encouraging the grandmother to attend the wedding. So take a listen. In that conversation with that grandmother, I was concerned about the well-being of their relationship more than anything else, hence my counsel. Don't misunderstand that in any way at all. If I was in the receiving end of another question about another situation from another person in another time, I may answer absolutely differently. But in that case, I answered in that way, and I would not answer in any other way, no matter what anybody says on the internet as of the last 10 days. If that were the case, I would never, if that were the case, I would never, I should never have said it in the first place. If people want to, me to recant and to repent, to repent? I, I, I repent daily because I say a lot of things that I shouldn't say. I mean, check with Sue. But the fact of the matter is I'm not ready to repent over this. I don't have to. So what did you think? Well, as shocking as that, that ending part of that clip was, I want to go back to something that he said at the beginning of that, cl that particular clip. He said, I, the reason that he gave that lady that advice was because he was more concerned about her relationship with her grandson than anything else. Yeah. What is a pastor supposed to be most concerned with when he counsels someone? He is supposed to be concerned about shepherding that person to do what God's word says, not about relationships. <laughs> We're going to cover this in a few minutes when we talk about some some scriptures. But scripture tells us, Jesus told us when he was here on earth, he, he had come to set the members of a family against one another, not on purpose, but because the gospel divides. If you stand true to scripture, you it's going to cost you something. And in some cases, it's going to cost you family members. And it is time as Christians that we stood up and accepted that and realized that no matter how painful it may be, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy, 
But that is what this pastor should have counseled this woman. You have got to do what scripture says and let the chips fall where they may, regardless of what the outcome may be. You trust God with the outcome. Your job is not to worry about about the outcome. Your job is to submit to scripture and obey it. And so that's what, you know, we want to get to the, the other things that he said as well, but that just really jumped out at me. Scripture is our authority, not what may or may not happen in a particular situation. That is pragmatism and that is unbiblical. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, he in that clip reiterated uh, and throughout that, you know, my stance on homosexuality hasn't changed. And that's supposed to, um, I guess, excuse him from this this poor counsel. Um, and, and we know it hasn't changed. That was never the question. But he makes it seem like he is being attacked or being a victim uh, or going soft or something. And he hasn't. But it's all about this counsel that he gave. And uh, and I was a little bothered by the clapping, um, the applauding. Yeah, I was going to say that, too. That that's disturbing. I mean, the, people sitting under his teaching should not be clapping. You know, his previous teaching that was so good, they should know there's something wrong with this. Yeah. You know. Well, uh, then uh, a few minutes go by, and he explains to uh, the people in in the audience at his church that um, he is a product of British evangelism, and then he takes a swipe at American fundamentalism. So here's what he said. I have never been a product of American fundamentalism. I come from a world in which it is possible for people to actually grasp the fact that there are nuances in things. Those of you who are lawyers understand this. Everything is not so categorically clear that if you put one foot out of this box, you've got to be removed from the box forever. Yeah, so Michelle, there he's saying that American fundamentalists don't have the common sense to understand nuance, and, you know, we're very rigid. Everything's black and white is what he seems to be saying there. What did you hear? Oh, <laughs> he he is a Brit on American soil. And um, <laughs> I don't know if he's an American citizen or not, but he sounds like he's a, he's a Brit on American soil. And, of course, we love our British brothers and sisters, but I— you go over to somebody's house and and you don't poke at them, you know, and you, you're coming over here from another country and, you know, throwing your your British weight around and saying we're we're better than you. Essentially, <laughs> it's just not very polite. And um, we've had Englishmen come over here in the past several hundred years ago and and try to do that. And, and we didn't take to that too well. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Well, and he, he's using fundamentalism, you know, and putting the word American in front of it, American fundamentalism as a, a pejorative, uh, as an insult, right. you know, um, and, and that's not that's not very wise either or, or right. very kind. Right. You, you know, and, and what does fundamentalism mean? It means that you basically believe in the fundamentals of Scripture. You believe the Bible is true. Right. Right. And so and, and you don't find those fuzzy spots and rest on that, you know, yet, yeah, and people say, oh, you Christians are always say the Bible is clear. Well, it, it is clear, you know, and yes, there's room for interpretation um, on things that aren't, uh, you know, the first matters. But but yes, the, the Bible very clearly states some things that we're talking about tonight. Right. That's really true. And, you know, that it, got, it touches back a little bit to what he was saying in the previous clip about how if it were another situation, another circumstance, he might have given different advice. But the Bible is clear on this. There is no situation in which it would be appropriate to advise someone to attend a wedding like this. And that goes with what you're saying, Amy. The Bible's, the Bible's not wishy-washy on this, okay? The Bible tells us the truth about this. And it's, yeah. the, the wishy-washy ones are us. You know, we're the ones who who try to find loopholes and try to to um, cheat a little here and cheat a little there or whatever, even in our own personal lives. But, um, yeah, the Bible doesn't waver on things like this. It doesn't it, it doesn't it's not situational ethics. Right. Uh, so. So, yeah, what you're saying is exactly right. Well, why don't we go to our final clip uh, from that sermon? Um, this is where at the end he brings it back to his advice to the grandmother. We can disagree over whether I gave that grandmother good advice or not. Not everybody on the pastoral team thinks I gave very good advice. And as I said, 
you know, on another occasion with a different person in a different context, the advice may be very different. But at least let's acknowledge the fact that what we're doing is we're wrestling with biblical principle. And when principle for, let's say, holiness of life comes up against the principle of love for your enemy, how are you, how are you going to put that together? You got a problem with the grandmother showing up, sitting on the front row in a context that she absolutely despises and sitting on our lap, nicely wrapped with beautiful paper and a bow around it is her gift, the gift of a Bible. For a granddaughter, she knows, has no interest in the Bible. But because she believes that the entrance of God's word brings light, she is prepared to trust the Holy Spirit to do the work. All right. There's a lot to unpack there, Michelle. Um, why don't we start with uh, the fact that not everybody on his pastoral team agreed with uh, the advice. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I hope they, goodness gracious, I hope that uh, as as we're praying, we're uh, so many of us are praying for this situation, yeah. that they, the Holy Spirit really convicts them to really come alongside him intensely and and reprimand him and uh, try to talk some sense into him. I mean, he can still we're, we're talking about him. He just said, I, I won't repent, you know, a few minutes ago. And but he still could, you know, he the Lord could change his heart. He could repent next week. Yes. He could repent next month, next year, 10 years from now. Who knows? But um, it's going to take those who are closest to him standing up to him and saying, um, you, this is wrong. You know, you, we're calling you to repentance. So I really hope that that's what's going on. And again, um, there was a lot of scolding and shaming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he didn't really address what uh, others have have beseeched him and exhorted him uh, to talk about, and that was, right. you know, the concerns, the the fallout. Um, so he he really was uh, shaming the um, the Pharisees, I guess. Right. Um, but the story itself had changed quite a bit from last September, and um, again, you know, he had been talking about this this grandson all along, and uh, this particular night, uh, he never said grandson. He it was a a granddaughter, and there's something else that was interesting too. For the first time, we heard that the grandmother was sitting in the front row uh, with her uh, gift, and it was all packaged in a bow, and it was a Bible. Yeah. Uh, that that's new information, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, you know, we all tell stories, and sometimes we forget a detail, sometimes we misspeak. So, I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that that's what he did here, but. Uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean, he, it seems as though he's told this story a number of times and uh, would probably include uh, important details like that and would at least get straight whether it's a granddaughter or a grandson. Um, well, but the Bible uh, has significance in this case because this can be used as a tool to uh, shame the Pharisees. You know, how yes. dare you? She was sitting there with a Bible, God's very word that she had planned to give to uh, this grandchild. And, uh, you know, so that that was something that's like, oh, you, yeah. you hear that and maybe you're not uh, as discerning and, and you hear that and go, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry for even questioning you. Of course, she should have gone and brought a Bible, you know. Yeah. Uh, so whether or not that was even true, I thought that was very interesting that he used that for the first time, knowing that he would have a huge uh, audience uh, that would be listening. Yeah, I, I think some people might surmise from that, that he was trying to spin things uh, to be more in his favor with this advice that he yeah. had given. Um, I, I don't want to go that far and say that, uh, I, it's unfortunate that it will look like that to some people. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to, to, to go that far and, and say that's definitely what he was trying to do, but it, it could seem that way. But the, the Bible, <laughs> the, whether or not she takes the Bible to this wedding is irrelevant. She's still there. Um, and right. why hadn't she given this child a Bible before? Why couldn't she stay home from the wedding and give him give him or her whatever it was a Bible afterwards? You know, um, it's it's irrelevant to her presence at the wedding. Her her presence is more important than her present, you know. Um, so, yeah, so that that doesn't mitigate taking a Bible doesn't mitigate the fact that she is she's going to this wedding, so to speak, wedding. So, yeah. 
Well, um, one of the main points that we have talked about tonight is that Alistair Begg needs to repent of this horribly unbiblical advice that he gave this woman. But, you know, listening to his remarks in these clips, it really, he, it really seems like he does not understand why he needs to repent. And maybe some of our listeners need a little clarity on that as well. So let's do what we do and take it back to Scripture. And I want to start off with James 3, verse 1. And I want us to view all of the other Scriptures we're about to discuss through that lens. James 3, 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. The advice that Alistair Begg gave the one, the grandmother is pastoral malpractice. And it's the very reason that God included James 3, 1 in his word to rightly put a healthy fear of the Lord into pastors and by extension, any of us who teach God's word. God places on our shoulders an enormous responsibility to handle his word correctly, as 2 Timothy yes. 15 tells us. We do not right, right. Yeah, we do not teach people to make decisions, again, based on our personal opinions about someone's anticipated reaction. We teach them to obey scripture regardless of what we or they think the outcome will be. And so if we're going to teach people to obey scripture regardless, here is what scripture tells us about some of these things. Um, first of all, marriage is between one man and one woman. We find this out from Genesis 2, 20 through 24. It says the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Yes. And, and you know the New Testament talks about this this as well. Um, you know, some people might think, well, that was all the Old Testament. You know, the the world has changed, and I'm I'm sure God has changed along with it. No, He doesn't. And uh, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and and forever. Um, so right. it says in Hebrews thirteen four, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And again, that's Hebrews thirteen four. Right. And uh, and then there's others. There, there are so many other verses that we could talk about. Let's go to Romans, because it says we're not to be ashamed of the gospel. And a major component, which is the wrath of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. That's Romans uh, 1, 16 through 18. Rather, we are to be willing to shed our own blood for obedience to Scripture, as it says in Hebrews 12, 4, compromising with sin is one form of being ashamed of the gospel. That's absolutely right. We've got to be sure that we are standing for the truth of scripture. And, and yeah. you know, like you were talking about earlier, contextualizing is one way of being ashamed of the gospel. If you feel like you have to, yeah. to change scripture or to make scripture more palatable for people or, you know, teach them to do something uh, like like Alistair Begg did with this lady, that is not in line with scripture. All of those things fall under the category of being ashamed of the gospel. Um, and then yes. in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, it says, we're to abstain from even the appearance of evil. We talked earlier yes. about uh, what is it going to look like for this lady to attend this wedding? Uh, what's it going to look like to her friends, to the other people in at, in attendance at the wedding, to the the couple themselves, to the person officiating? It she is <laughs> yeah. she is giving the appearance of evil that she approves of this wedding. 
Yeah. And you mentioned before, Michelle, uh, a Bible verse that talked about how Jesus didn't come to bring peace between pagans and Christians, but a sword. And anyone who puts loyalty to family ahead of loyalty to Jesus and his word is not worthy of him. And and this is what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's Enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Um, again, Matthew chapter ten. That is a, a very stern warning, and and it's a it's a hard verse for people, especially if you're not familiar with scripture and and haven't been doing this for a while and and walking with the Lord. That can be a very hard thing to understand. Um, but you know, if you've been a, a pastor for you know forty plus years, that that's something that you would teach quite often, right? And again, I just want to emphasize to all of us. This is this kind of thing is coming. If it hasn't come for you already, Amy and I both have loved ones who have cut us out of the, out of their lives because we stand for the truth of Scripture, and it's painful and it's hard, and nobody wants to go through it. But ladies, you have got to set your mind to the fact that you you've got to accept that it's going to cost you something to follow Christ. If if you stand for Christ in any measurable way, it is going to cost you something, and you better get your mind made up right now before it happens that you are going to cast your lot with Christ, no matter what it costs you, no matter what. Amen. Um, yeah. Romans one thirty two again is another uh, another verse that <laughs> we need to really think about in light of this situation. It says, "Though they did not, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things and such things he's referring to earlier in the chapter where he talks about sexual immorality and things of this nature, idolatry." Uh, things of this nature. He says, those who practice such things as those deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now here, you know, he's, what he's saying yeah. is it's, it's not just wrong to participate in these things, but also to give approval to people who do these other people who do these things. And he's, he's talking about um, the people who are actually doing the sinful thing, you know, giving approval to others who practice that same sinful thing. So if it's if yeah. it's such an abomination to God to for sinners to approve of other sinners practicing these things, how much more of an abomination is it to God for Christians to approve of sinners who do these things or to even appear give the appearance of evil to, you know, approve of sinners who do these things? Yeah, and you know, we talked before Michelle about how you know what what is the purpose of a wedding in and having the ceremony and guests and 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 anyone who goes to a wedding knows that um, this is a celebration. We're there to celebrate and to um, encourage on this couple, this married couple, and, and to witness to right. them. And uh, so I'm looking at some of these other verses. First Corinthians uh, chapter 10. There's a uh, verse uh, 18 says, "Are though are not those who eat the sacrifices?" participants in the altar. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Again, 1 Corinthians 10, 18. And then uh, 1 Timothy 5, 22 says, do not take part in the sins of others. And uh, again, that's exactly what would happen if you were to go to uh, a so-called wedding of, of people who, uh, you know, just hate God. They, they're uh, openly rebelling against him sexually, you know, in sexual that's right. sin. I mean, we can see this theme over and over and over again in these passages and the one I'm about to read, that God does not want us to participate in sin or appear to approve of those who are participating in sin, which in a way is participating in it ourselves if we're giving approval to it. Listen to Ephesians 5, 5 through 17, and this is an excerpt from that passage. 
For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, like sexual immorality, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. That's serious there. The wrath of God is coming on this yeah. uh, this wedding couple that we're talking about here. Therefore, do not become partners with them. If you're a witness at their wedding, you are partnering with them in, in this way to, to approve of this union. Uh, verse 8 says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And nothing at that wedding is good and right and true. Verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, not what will be pleasing to this couple, but what will be pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. That's how much clearer could God have been? Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. That's what the so-called wedding is. But instead expose them. Verse 12, for it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret, much less attend them yourself. That's just my, I'm adding that in. That doesn't say that in verse 12. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Again, Michelle, I, I think that, you know, the the people who hear the advice that, you know, oh, it's okay now to attend as a Christian, uh, a wedding between people who are trans or gay, you know, whatever the situation is, um, I don't think they've thought it through. And I don't think that they have these right. verses in mind. If you're a Christian, um, these are the verses that speak so clearly of it. Um, and, and one more, um, Proverbs 17, 15 says, he who justifies the wicked, and he who condemns the righteous, Righteous are both alike in the, an abomination to the Lord. Yeah. It, wow. Yeah. If you're going to this wedding, that's what you're doing. You are justifying the wicked by your presence. These are really serious things. This is not just, oh, should I go to such and such wedding or not? Oh, I don't feel like going, so I won't go. Oh, it sounds like fun, so I will go. It's not a flippant little thing. This is justifying the wicked. And that that is an abomination to the Lord. This is so serious. This is why James 3, 1, like I read at the beginning, says that those of us who teach, especially pastors, will be judged more strictly because we're supposed to know. We're supposed to know what scripture says about these things. And, you know, I'm not including us women as pastors, but especially they are supposed to know what the Bible says about these things and to proclaim it in truth and to warn people. That's that's really important. That's another job of pastors is to warn people not to do these things so that they won't be an abomination to the Lord and all these other things that we've just read. Oh, Amy, I'm just outdone with this. Yeah, Michelle, that is completely understandable. And and I know that a lot of you listening are, are just heartbroken to hear this, but I have to bring up something else now. Uh, one final point we'd like to mention in this whole thing is that, you know, some people seem to think that this is the first misstep that Pastor Alistair Begg has ever made, and it's not. Um, there have been a, a couple of other concerning instances that we would like to note. Yeah, that's right, Amy. This is not Beg's first rodeo. Um, I, I maintain a list of pastors and Bible teachers that I recommend over at my blog. And Beg used to be on that list, but I removed him about a year and a half ago. I didn't warn against him. I didn't say he was a false teacher or anything like that. I was just no longer willing to say by putting him on my recommended teachers list, hey, this is a great teacher you should go listen to. And I did that because of these two incidents that we're going to briefly mention. You can find out more by going to the show notes and and clicking on the link for my blog article about Alistair Begg. It's got the videos. It's got, you know, all the the evidence. But first, uh, one of my followers brought it to my attention that Alistair Begg endorses the idea of a woman preaching or teaching the Sunday morning message in church. In other words, preaching and teaching to men 
as long as she has been invited to do so and been given permission to do so by the pastor and elders. And he has invited and permitted at least one woman that I know of to do this at his own church. And this is unbiblical. Yeah, Yeah, we all do things from time to time uh, that are dumb. And, you know, all of us, we're sinners and well-known pastors are no exception. But Begg's statements in that sermon about that particular incident, you know, that wasn't a like a one-time oopsie. It wasn't just a little lapse in judgment. Those, his statements there, those are the well-thought-out, well-planned and implemented policy of the church that he pastors. So that was that was the first incident that concerned us. Yeah, and and again, if you want to go listen to that, um, and you're you've got some concerns about that, you just go ahead and um, click on our show notes there. But the second incident too, some of our listeners may also recall that in 2019, uh, not too long ago, Pastor Begg shared the stage with Beth Moore, uh, Tony Evans, a female pastor, and several others at Baylor University's National Preaching Conference. Uh, much to the chagrin of his followers, there was a, a big um, outcry back then, and this was a conference where. Pastors and seminary students were instructed on being better pastors by two women. You know, as with the transsexual wedding issue we've discussed tonight, there were numerous protests from his followers prior to that event. So, you know, in in response to a follower who expressed concern, a statement from Pastor Begg's ministry indicated that he accepted uh, the invitation to speak without knowing who any of the other speakers were. And you know what? That that's happened to me before. Yeah. So you can totally understand accepting an, an engagement without knowing who else was there. However, uh, long before he spoke there, many people urged him, who who loved him, admired him very nicely and kindly, um, urged him to drop out, and um, he kept the speaking engagement. So, um, so again, there, there's that. Yeah, and I'm just thinking back to a, a, an episode we did a few months ago, a, a What Would You Do episode, where we talked about this same yeah. kind of thing, and you were involved in a, a similar situation a few years ago where you accepted a speaking engagement not knowing who the other teachers were going to be. And then uh, another uh, teacher was asked to speak who, you know, there was a lot of biblical problems with this this teacher. And you handled right. it the right way and the admirable way. You, you well, know, you. talked to very kindly and lovingly, I'm sure, talked to the people who were in charge and explained the situation. And fortunately, they they listened to you and realized that this teacher was problematic and and disinvited her. Uh, but you handled that the yeah. right way. And so that was very admirable. And you set a very good example for all of us. And I'm just thinking, how amazing would it be uh, had he had he listened to the um, the concerns of his followers and said, oh, you're right. This is not, you know, sharing the stage with Beth Moore and this woman preacher instructing men on how to be better pastors. This is not biblical and I need to I need to back out. Um, How amazing would that have been? What an impact it would have made. But unfortunately, he chose to keep that speaking engagement. Uh, And I guess we could say that was maybe another incident where he sort of doubled down on what he was going to do. And he was going to to go ahead and keep that speaking engagement. But, um, you know, um, Alistair Begg, he's not a new Christian. He's not a young pastor who made a rookie mistake in all of these things. The question of whether or not to attend a transsexual wedding should be a no-brainer for any Christian, let alone a seasoned pastor with many, many decades of experience and also a worldwide public ministry. Counseling a sheep to base her behavior on a sinner's opinions and feelings rather than to submit to and obey God's clear word belies a foundational problem with his theology, as do all of his other errors and mishandlings of Scripture that that we've covered tonight. And unfortunately, and very sadly, because of that, I believe we're going to continue to see Beg make these kinds of blatant errors in the future. Yeah, well, and time will tell. And, and I, I hope that he does come around. And I know you do, too. Yes. Um, so, y- yes. you know, in conclusion, we've already gone pretty long here. Um, we are all going to have to wrestle with these moments in the culture that we're in. And again, we, we do share this, this talkback episode to help you stand on biblical truth, not to slander or nitpick somebody, or as some have said, to create 
crucify a brother? Uh, I, that's an unfortunate phrase, and I hear it a lot. We are not doing yeah. that, nor are we telling you what to think or how you should regard this pastor, because we're going to see more and more of this division in the church, just as Jesus said would happen over these cultural matters. We're going to see this with other pastors, too, which are these are really biblical issues at heart. They're not just cultural, they're biblical. Um, you know, and not that it matters what I think or what Michelle thinks or where we land on this, but for what it's worth, here's where I land. Alistair Begg is still a brother in Christ who has given some egregious counsel. He is not someone I recommend for that reason, but I'm also not looking at him with disdain or mocking or scoffing. Absolutely not. And that would be sinful if I did. So I need to look at him with love. And I will continue to lift him up in prayer. And I do think it will be a powerful thing if he would only um, turn this around and say that his counsel was not biblical. I think that would be so powerful. But, you know, not recommending a teacher does not equal crucifying a man. He is not a heretic or an apostate, just a teacher who gave some very unbiblical advice and uh, perhaps has, has made some unbiblical choices. So ladies, you may view this differently, right? But Michelle and I, we want to make sure that at least what we're doing with this program is that we are thinking biblically based on what God's word says and not emotions. What do you think, Michelle? Well, I completely agree. Um, as as I said, you know, like you did, I I stopped recommending him about a year and a half ago. Um, I yeah. I kind of have with teachers. I sort of have a a very loose, well, maybe not very loose, but a loose red, yellow, red light, yellow light, green light sort of system. I have my red light teachers who are definitely false teachers, and I warn people against them. I have my green light teachers who are good and solid you know they're not perfect but they're they're solid they're doctrinally sound and i highly recommend them to people you know for podcasts or sermons to listen to or whatever and then i have my yellow light people and these are people that you know i'm not really sure that they're false teachers that they've risen to the level of false teacher yet but i'm still not going to say hey this is a great person you should go you should go listen to this yeah. person's teaching i'm just i'm just going to kind of not really not really say anything about it. I'm not going to warn against them, yeah. but I'm not going to recommend them either. And that's that's sure. where Alistair Begg is for me. He's still in that yellow light um, category. I hope he repents and let's move him back to the green light category, you know. Uh, but I don't consider him a false teacher. I'm also not questioning his salvation. I got a, a question about that from a follower today. Uh, do I think that uh, you know, all these people who are calling him to repentance, do I think that they're saying he's not saved? Well, no, of course not. I've not heard a single right. person who has called him to repentance say that they think he's not saved. That's that's kind of crazy to go go that far right now. And I don't I don't think that either. Um, so we're not questioning his salvation. And, and we also want to remember, like I said before, he could still repent and we pray that he does. Um, so, so that's kind of how I am sort of viewing him right now. And, and again, we need to learn from what he's, he's done wrong and use that as a warning to us that we don't follow in those same sort of, sort of footsteps. Um, we need to really be teachable. We need to repent. We need to make sure that everything we think and say and do and believe and feel lines up with the word of God. So that that would be my my closing uh, note to our listeners. Yes. And when we mess up, we need to own it and yes. uh, make it right. That's so, right. Uh, well, I, th- I think we need to wrap up, Michelle. We've, we've been to these ladies' ears for a long time tonight. Thank you for joining us on this sad, but I think necessary talk back episode of A Word Fitly Spoken. We would like to just take a second and say thank you so much to Rhonda for her kindness in being a regular donor on PayPal. Thank you so much. And to all of you who uh, help support this podcast. And if, if this ministry has been a blessing to you and you'd like to do that just like Rhonda does on PayPal or by regularly giving monthly at uh, Patreon, just go to a wordfitlyspoken.life and uh, click on that support tab. That's right. And we'd also like to thank one of our listeners who goes by the handle, I think this is ewe 10 over on Apple Podcasts. Some of you people have very interesting uh, handles over there on Apple Podcasts. But we'd like to thank this person for leaving us a five-star rating and this encouraging review. And this is what this person said. 
wisdom and encouragement. I discovered this podcast several months ago and have been binge listening ever since. These ladies have so much wisdom and share it in an encouraging way. They aren't just giving their opinions, but back up everything with scripture. After listening to them, I can articulate various doctrines and beliefs much better and know where to go in scripture to learn more. Thank you for boldly and lovingly speaking the truth. Well, that is, well, yeah, the Lord. and Thank you. you know that is so encouraging to us. Not because you're just saying nice things about us, but because you're learning to do what we want you to learn to do, which is to go to Scripture. That's our goal. We're not here to get you to to listen to us, but to push you closer to Christ and and closer to His Word. Yeah. So, uh, but thank you so Amen. much for your kind words and for listening to a word fitly spoken. And we'd like to encourage all of our listeners: if you love a word fitly spoken, let us hear from you. Leave us a five-star rating and an encouraging comment on your favorite podcast platform. Yeah, and until next time, talk back to false teaching and walk worthy. 